Luke chapter 12. That's where we'll be. So I've never watched the show, but are there any fans of the masked singer in the room? Anybody? Nobody's ever watched the show. Okay, so um, do, do, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Let's start there. So there's this show, and apparently well-known singers. Is this right, Jason, because you're nodding your head? Okay, I, I have somebody that actually has seen the show. Okay. Apparently well-known singers dress up in these elaborate um, costumes, and, of course, the most important part is the mask. So their identity's hidden, and they sing different music than they normally sing. Is that kind of the deal? So they, they, could, they could go musically to a whole new genre, and then there's these, this panel, and, and everybody's trying to figure out who's behind the mask, right? And, you know, again, you, you've got R&B guys singing very sedate music, totally different, you know, no beat kind of stuff, and, and, and it's challenging. We all wear masks from time to time, don't we? Mark Twain said, we're all like the moon. We have a dark side we don't any, want anyone to see. And it's true, isn't it? Can we just go ahead and let our guard down and get real from the very beginning this morning? I'll start. Sometimes I'm a hypocrite. And here's the deal, whether you want to go your turn or not, we're all, from time to time, to some degree or the other, hypocrites. The Greek word for hypocrite, it it was actually taken from the theater of, of, of the Greek age. And what that talked about was the idea is, you could translate it this way, a play actor. Because in that day they would actually have masks that they would use to portray a character, and they would hold up a mask in front of their face, and that would make them this character. And it's amazing how God puts truth in Scripture through certain languages at certain times, because that's just how we do when we're being hypocrites. We think we're hiding and portraying something that we're not because we hold a mask up in front of our lives, and hope everybody buys the mask. It's like the story that is told of the famous actor Robert Redford. Apparently, one time Robert Redford was walking through a hotel lobby, and a woman saw him and followed him to the elevator and said, are you the real Robert Redford? With great excitement, she asked him. And as the doors of the elevator were closing, he replied, only when I'm alone. And sometimes that's the truth for us. Today, we're going to see Jesus' remedy for hypocrisy. Here's the message title that I want you to to take home with you and, and, and the truth that goes with it. We're going to talk today from Luke chapter 12, a fear, about a fear that removes fear. A fear that removes fear. The take home truth is this, if you will fear God and trust Jesus as your Savior, you don't have to fear God. At least not in the same way. We'll talk a little bit about the details of that later. But if you will fear God and trust Jesus as your Savior, then you don't have to fear God. Again, Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, and so that refers back to the end of chapter 11, where he had just dressed down the scribes and the Pharisees And at the end of that chapter, in verse 53, it says, As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him, crouched like a lion to kill its prey, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. In the meantime, chapter 12 begins, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another. So I want you to get the scene here. The word translated many thousands here, it, it means myriads. It, it spoke of, in that day, they didn't really talk in numbers higher than 10,000. It spoke of 10,000 plus. Some scholars estimate that there were well over 30,000 people present on this occasion. And just imagine something like the hysteria and the, the craziness, the trampling of a European soccer match, right? 
The crowds are going nuts, and they're stepping on each other. They're trampling one another, trying to get to and be close to Jesus. He had become that popular. We learn as we continue through, the crowds one day turn on him, but today they were in mass trying to see him. And yet, with tens of thousands of people following him, the text says that Jesus focuses on his disciples first. Pick it up there in verse 1. He began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark, shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. The word used for hell here is, there's different words used for hell throughout the New Testament scriptures. The word used for hell here is the word Gehenna. It literally translates from the Hebrew, the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was on the the south side of Jerusalem, and it had become for the the Israelite people, the, the, the nation of Israel, a picture of hell, the place of eternal punishment for the wicked. It was a place there outside the south on the southwest side of the city of Jerusalem, outside the city wall. It was a place where the children of Judah had been burned as sacrifices to the pagan god Molech. And so, therefore, it was a forever unclean place. It became, as it were, the city dump uh, with a perpetual fire burning there to consume the trash and all of the sewage of the city would go there. And so there was a fire forever burning. There was a stench forever rising. Uh, It was the place that Jesus would in another place discuss where the fire is never quenched, where the worm never dies. The trash heap's always got worms and it's always got fire. That's the picture that Jesus evokes when he says, fear the one who can cast into hell. Verse 5, but I will warn you whom to fear again. Him, fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. A fear that removes fear. If you will fear God and trust Jesus as your Savior, you don't have to fear God. Jesus in this text reveals four actions we each must take in order to be able to live fearlessly as children of God. Four actions. First of all, in verse 1, beware of the spread of hypocrisy in your life and in the church. Beware, the text says in verse 1, be on guard, that word means, of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, we've already talked about hypocrisy briefly. Again, it means, in this case, pretending to be righteous. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were pretending to be righteous. They, they actually looked righteous and were externally righteous. They had it all together in their public behavior. They did all the right stuff in public. But Jesus says they had hearts full of sin and behaving sinfully, were behaving sinfully in secret. But he says here, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What's the deal with leaven? Well, leaven is yeast, in short. And I'm not a baker, but if you bake, you know that in order to make any sort of bread or cake rise, you have to have what? Yeast. Some sort of rising stuff. And usually just a pinch or two. Lisa, is this right? Because I, I know you know about... And, and David. David knows about baking. So, so just a pinch or two is all you need, right? And just a little bit of leaven, just a little bit of yeast put into a, a, a big batch of bread for, dough for bread will make that whole lump of dough rise. It it permeates the whole lump and the whole batch of 
dough rises. I sound like I know what I'm talking about, bacon donut. I have no clue. Uh, but that's how it works. Now, this image used by Jesus of leaven to speak of the Pharisees, I mean, the kicker is when he tells them what it is. It's hypocrisy. But even just the image of leaven would have been offensive to them because they would have imagined themselves more like unleavened bread. Bread without yeast, like the special bread used in the Passover, which was to be a picture of purity and sinlessness and cleansing of themselves, being cleansed by God. And so here, they're basic, Jesus is basically saying, beware of the sin of the Pharisees which specifically is hypocrisy. These who portray themselves as sinless. Jesus says the Pharisees' teaching is leaven. It's sin. In particular, they're hypocrites who teach one thing, but do another, who look good on the outside, but are actually, as Jesus said in chapter 11, greedy and wicked on the inside. In another place, Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28, you'll see it on the screen. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful. In that day, they would paint the outside of the the stone-hewn tomb, and, and they would paint it white to make it attractive. But what's always in a tomb? which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also, Jesus says to the Pharisees and the scribes, you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Again, these were teachers of the law. They were experts in the law. They were the ones that that knew the law better than anybody. And Jesus says, you're lawless. Commentator Leon Morris says, Leaven speaks of a penetration that is slow, insidious, and constant. In this case, the leaven is hypocrisy. The practice of saying one thing and doing another eats at the moral life like a canker. Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And he says it to who? He says it, the Scripture says, to his disciples first. Thousands of people, tens of thousands around him. But he says, guys, here's the deal. We just came off this encounter with the Pharisees. You just heard me rebuke them strongly. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Before I go, I'm just getting close to my death, but here's the deal. Before I go, you be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. You watch out for hypocrisy. Because you see, if we allow ourselves to live hypocritically in one area of life, don't fool yourself today, we'll begin to get slack overall, and all of a sudden, we allow hypocrisy to spread to other areas of our lives. And all of a sudden, like a, like a cancer, it moves from one part of our hearts to another until we're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He didn't say that to Pharisees. He said that to you. He said that to me. Those of us who say we follow Jesus. He said it to his disciples. You beware. Chad, you beware of hypocrisy in your own life. Beware of the spread of sin in your life and in the life of the church. This is also true of the church. Jesus does not address that here, but I think it's important that we do. Today, we have the rest of the New Testament scriptures that include this passage in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. Let me set the tone for you. The church at Corinth had someone who was sleeping with his father's wife. They had sexual sin going on in their church, and the whole church and community knew about it. It was known. What were they doing about it as a church? Absolutely nothing. In fact, in verse 6, we learned that they were actually proud of how they were doing as a church. While this was going on, they were pretty excited about how things were going down at their local Baptist church. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know, this is how I know I'm right, Lisa, do you do, about yeast, you do, not, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
Don't you know that a little sin in the church will permeate the whole thing? So what does Paul say to this church? What does he tell them they're to do about the sin, this immorality that they knew about in the church? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. Why? Why is it that we're without yeast, that we're without sin? Remember the picture uh, there being used? For Christ, not because of us, but for, because Christ. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. The implication is the sacrifice of Christ purifies us, cleanses us from all sin, takes out the yeast from our life, if you will. I don't mean that it makes us practically sinlessly perfect, that we never sin again, but he deals with our sin, and he indwells us and begins to change us. Verse 8, therefore let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul says, look, you guys are proud of how things are going at your church. Let me just tell you, they're not going that great at all. And you ought to be ashamed of how things are going. You ought not be proud because you're allowing this known sin to, to exist and be known church-wide and community-wide. You've got to deal with the sin. Beware of the spread of sin, both in your own personal life and in the life of the church. You see, if we allow someone to live in an open hypocrisy without any accountability, pretending to be good Mr. Churchgoer, Mrs. Churchgoer, but known sin, it's out there. If we allow that to happen, then we can expect the virus of hypocrisy to spread to others in the church who will be sinfully empowered by the example of the one. Now, this is a real good place to stop for a second and say this. Please don't go around looking for every little hint of hypocrisy in someone else's life. Amen? I mean, I mean here's the bottom line. You, if we look close enough, if we hung out long enough, then we could, me and you, both could find something in the other where we are not fully living up to what we say we want to be. Right? By the way, this is another place for another side off of that aside. We'll eventually get back on track. You know, the church is often criticized for being hypocritical, right? People, people don't come to church. People, people uh, have trouble with the church because it's just full of hypocrites. Well, here's the bottom line. Absolutely. It's 100% true. I mean, I confess that at the beginning, and you did too, right? We, 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 we know we're all hypocrites from time to time. Here's the deal. So is everyone else in the world, amen? The bottom line is no one fully lives up to their, even their own standards, much less the standards of God when they pretend to care about those. My grandma used to say, mind your own little red wagon. I had my sister, we had a cousin, and we'd all be over, and man, we'd get to picking, and one's tattling and, you know, telling on the other, and she'd just, she, she, she'd just say, look, mind your own little red wagon. Just go play over here, leave, leave them alone, just mind your own little red wagon. And that's a good principle to apply to this whole thing about holding hypocrisy accountable, we don't need to go looking for every little hint. That's not the, the idea here. Uh, I can just tell you, my own little red wagon has plenty enough of its own tendencies toward hypocrisy. I've got plenty to keep me busy, obeying Jesus here, guarding myself, being where, being on guard for the spread of hypocrisy in my own life, and so do you. But what we are talking about here is when hypocrisy runs rampant, when sin is left unchecked for long enough and openly enough that our witness of, for Jesus is in jeopardy. On such occasions, we should love Jesus and one another enough to have a talk, to sit down and, and help each other see and turn from our hypocrisy. So beware of the spread of hypocrisy in your life and in the church. Guard your heart and guard the witness of your church. Secondly, in verses 2 and 3, notice this. Jesus says, here's a second action we should take. Not only must we beware of the spread of, of sin in our lives, but secondly, we must realize that you cannot hide your sin from God who will expose it on judgment day. 
That's a hard reality, isn't it? I mean, things just got real quick. Nothing is covered up, Jesus said, that will not be revealed. The Pharisees are hypocrites. I'm telling you to watch out for their, their sin. It could be yours. You could be a hypocrite too. You could, you could say one thing and do another. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you've said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you've whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. See, here's the, here's, here's the thing. We can get away with hypocrisy with each other in the eyes of men. We can put on a mask and play the part of someone who loves Jesus but secretly live for ourselves according to our own agendas and our own ambitions and desires. We can show up in sun, on Sunday. We can, we can do and say the right things to look like Someone who loves Jesus. But then, secretly, we can be participating in all kind of wickedness, according to Scripture. You see, we can have people fooled. You know what, you know what Jesus just said in, this, in these two verses, though? You cannot fool God. You can't hide anything from the all-seeing eyes of the Almighty. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. There Paul says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. You can't tell him one thing and live another way and think he doesn't know and just that he still buys what you said but not aware of what you do. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so Paul says, if you sow seed to sin, even if you do it quietly in that back room, if you sow seed to sin, eventually your sin will grow a visible plant in your life. You will reap what you sowed. I mean, I'm not a big gardener. I've done a few. But, you know, if you plant a kernel of corn in the ground, somebody tell me, anybody, you're all better gardeners than me, I'm sure, what kind of plant's going to come up from that kernel of corn you planted? Corn, every, every single time. Every single time. When an acorn falls in the woods and gets buried in the dirt, what kind of little sapling grows up? Now, that's a, trick, a little harder question if you don't know where acorns come from. It's an oak tree, isn't it? Every time. But even if it never manifests openly in this life, even if the seeds you plant never make your sin visible to the world, to people, Jesus says it is seen by God. And it will be exposed on judgment day. If you continue to not turn from sin and acknowledge it and call it what God calls it, then on the day of judgment, due to your lack of repentance, it will be exposed. Realize, Jesus says, that you cannot hide your sin from God who will, if we continue in unrepentance and and, and and without faith in the Lord Jesus for cleansing and, 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 and justification, it will by God be exposed on judgment day. Beware of the spread of sin in your life, especially hypocrisy. Realize that you cannot hide your own sin from God, and if you continue to hide it, He will expose it. And therefore, Jesus says, thirdly, fear God, because that's true, because nothing can be hidden, because God sees everything Fear God who can cast into hell, verses 4 and 5. I tell you, my friends. This is very interesting. This is the only time in the three synoptic gospels we call them, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're kinda, they kind of have a lot of parallel accounts going on about the life of Christ. John, he kind of wrote his own style, different, different format, all that. But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Mark, and Luke, this is the only time that Jesus calls his disciples friends. I tell you, my friends, 
And in this context, that's particularly significant and encouraging and comforting. I tell you then, listen to it, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. People, and after that, have nothing more that they can do. All any person or group of people can ever do to you, the worst they can do is kill your body. Jesus says, but I'll warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed your body, is implied here, has authority to cast into hell your soul. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And so even though these are strong words, these are hard sayings, Jesus couches it with this beginning, I tell you, my friends, I'm telling you this, disciples of mine, I'm telling you this, Jesus followers, church members of the East Elgin Baptist Church, I'm telling you this, Jesus says, because you're my friends, I love you, I care for you, I want the very best for you, so don't fear men. The worst they can do is kill you. Fear the one who can cast your soul forever in to hell. Don't live to please men. We care far too much about what other people think about us, don't we? Hello? We should live for an audience of one whose name is God. Don't fear those. Let me just stop there and say, and if you do that, if we'll live for God, uh, He's our audience, He's the only one we care who uh, care what thinks about us, here's the bottom line, you'll love people. You won't have some cavalier attitude about other people. You'll be sensitive to people. You'll, in the right way, care what people think because you'll want them to see Jesus in you. Y'all tracking? We do need to care what people think about us because here's the deal, it ain't about us, it's about Him. And so the deal is, they ought to see Jesus, not us. If they don't see Jesus, we ought to care about that. So there's a sense in which we should care about what other people think. Y'all tracking? So if we care what God thinks above all, it will change how we live and people will see Him in us. Don't fear people. Don't even fear those who may one day persecute you because you follow Jesus. We'll come to more on that next week. Rather, Jesus says, fear God who can cast your soul into hell forever. You say, Chad, do you really believe there's a literal hell? Absolutely. Scripture seems crystal clear on the matter. God gave them a picture right outside the city. We've talked about it. And Jesus plainly says, He can cast your soul into hell. He didn't mean He's going to throw them in the city dump. Why? Because their body's dead. This has to be something to do with the afterlife. Fear God who can cast you into hell forever. And so, don't live to please men. Live to please God and God alone. Again, Leon Morris says, the fear of God is rather out of fashion these days. We much prefer to stress the love of God. But while there's a sense in which perfect love casts out fear, and we'll come back to that, there is another in which fear is quite compatible with love. This kind of fear is continually regarded in the Bible as a necessary ingredient for right living. It's an attitude compound compounded of a recognition of the greatness and the righteousness of God on the one hand and our readiness to sin on the other. And we've got that, don't we? Fear of this kind guards against presumption and must find its place in a right faith. Jesus says, fear God who can cast you into hell. But understand, Jesus' desire in in this whole passage is that we fear God who can cast our soul into hell and don't live as hypocrites but get things right with between us and God so that ultimately we can enjoy, fourthly this morning, we can enjoy the love of our all-knowing Father. Look at verses 6 and 7. He transitions here. It's like, it's like a, 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 real, a real hard pivot right here, isn't it? Or so it seems. 
He comes right off of, of the end of verse 5, where he says, Yes, I tell you, fear him. The one who can cast you into hell, fear him. And then verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Now you say, what's this whole deal with sparrows? Were, like, like, were they big into birds back then or what? No. Well, what we think, based on, on history and what we can gather, <clears throat> is that people actually, the poor of the poorest of the poor, actually would eat sparrows. And so somebody would go out and kill sparrows and sell them at the market so the poor could afford them. They pay a penny a piece for them, uh, and and there and there you go, a couple pennies a piece for them. One commentator said that there's like an extra bird thrown in in what Jesus says right there, based on the economy of the day. I don't know, I didn't dig that deep, but if that's the case, notice Jesus says, and not one of them, one of those birds that are commonplace that the poor eat for dinner. Not one of them is forgotten before God. Not one, not even the free bird that was the three, the free sparrow they just threw in. Not even that sparrow is forgotten by God. God knows, knew about every single sparrow sold in the market there. Now, if you're thinking on the side, man, that's poor if you got to eat sparrows. Well, let me just tell you, there's people probably still alive in this room that lived during the Great Depression. There were some hard days then. I was talking to someone just a minute ago who said, if we didn't have squirrel, we'd starve to death. I know a guy in South Carolina, let me, let me beat that, he ate birds. He got paid a nickel apiece for robins. That's neither here nor there. Jesus knows about every sparrow that dies. And so he says, if that's the case, don't you know you're more valuable than birds? Fear not. He throws in another uh, image here. And I know you enjoy it when a bald man reads it. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, you say, does Jesus know the literal number of hairs? Well, of course he does. That's not really the point, right? It's not about how many hairs you have or don't have. The point is Jesus knows. And if he cares about hair, that eventually leaves you. Don't think he doesn't care more about you. Fear not. Jesus is saying here, fear so you don't have to fear. Fear God by coming to Jesus to deal with your sin, your hypocrisy, which Jesus, in fact, did deal with through his death on the cross and in his resurrection. Amen? Hello? Excuse me. Do we not know? Did Jesus deal with your sin on the cross? And in the resurrection, did he give you victory forevermore? Trust Jesus. And rest in his sin atoning, hypocrisy forgiving death on the cross. See, here's the good news. There is hope with God even for hypocrites. And again, hypocrites is all there are. But there's hope. There's grace. You see, when we trust Jesus this way, we can know God adopts us into his family and makes us, who were formerly his enemies, Scripture tells us, in our sin and our hypocrisy, he makes us who were formerly his enemies to be his beloved children by faith in Jesus Christ. And as his children, Jesus here tells us, our Father knows everything about us, things about us we don't know, and he cares about all the details of our lives. He loves us with an all-knowing love. We are, before God, fully known. And that's scary, isn't it? And yet, fully loved. That's called grace. Only available through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Leon Morris, again, the, just a great commentator on this passage, said his basic concern, Jesus' basic concern in, the, in verses 1 through 7, is to reassure his friends. Reassure his friends, not frighten them. It's kind of a tough passage. He knows things they do not know about themselves. So those who are of more value than many sparrows, that's me and you, who love Jesus, should face life without fear. We don't have to fear men. But if we've come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, if we've been adopted as sons and daughters, then no longer do we have to fear the wrath of God. Why? Because Jesus bore all of God's justice toward my sin on the cross in his own body when he died there. And when he was raised from the dead on the third day, it was God's way of saying it was all paid. The work is done. Salvation is given. And now here's power for you, Chad Kelly, to live differently in this world by, my, by the power of the resurrection brought to you by the indwelling of my own spirit. I love 1 John 4. In verse 9 it says this, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. What, what were we before we met Jesus? We weren't living. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And, and just uh, get the picture. Dead people don't raise themselves. Amen? People don't just decide, unless you're Jesus, that you're coming out of the grave. We were dead in sin, and, and yet... God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, verse 10. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Skipping down to verse 16 of 1 John 4. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Our only hope is in the love of God. We know and we rely on the love of God. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. John says, if you really get the gospel, if you really trust Jesus, then you understand what he did. You understand that he took all of God's punishment for your sins. You understand God, God's not going to do the double jeopardy thing. He can't punish, he won't punish in his justice your sin twice. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't put Jesus on the cross for that, and, 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 and now he's going to suddenly change his mind when you get out of line and, and send you to hell for it too. He's not going to do that. And so if you really understand the love of God, if you truly embraced Christ, then perfect love, God's perfect love to you, drives out fear. You don't fear the judgment of God. Why? Because you are His beloved Son, completely and forever forgiven. It's true of you, what says in Romans 8, verse 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation ever again for you who are in Christ Jesus. But if we don't start with the fear of God, realizing our sin before Him and allowing it to drive us to Jesus, then we should still be afraid of holy God and all of His eternal wrath against our sin. But if we will start with a fear that removes fear, we run to Jesus because of our sin and need for a Savior, and in Him we find Love and grace and forgiveness that causes us to never have to fear again. What a beautiful, beautiful salvation. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Having his sin atoning work applied to our lives so that we are totally forgiven of all of our sins and seen as perfectly righteous in Jesus by holy God who is now our Father. So, we can enjoy the loving knowledge of our all-knowing Father. That's the fear that removes fear. 
Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17, and also chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, talk about those who feared the Lord. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Over in chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. This is judgment day of which we've already spoken. But here's a great description of it. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, said the Lord of hosts, so that it will, be, it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. What's God saying? If you fear me, then you will never have to fear me. If you fear me and run to the Savior, then on judgment day, you won't have to fear me. You'll be like a happy calf going out to play in the pasture. You'll be spared from my wrath. You'll, you'll, you, the Son of Righteousness shall rise on you with healing in its wings. There'll be nothing but good for you. A fear that removes fear. If you'll fear God and trust Jesus as your Savior, you don't have to fear God. John Piper relates a story about him and his son that helps us tie all this together. Piper says, I went to visit a man at his home with my son Karsten, who at the time was six. The man had a dog at the door when we opened the door, and he was a big dog. He looked Karsten eyeball to eyeball at six years of age. Huge dog. He says, I sent Karsten back to the car to grab something that we had forgotten, and the dog went loping behind the six-year-old at his same height, with a low little growl, and Karsten was terrified. The dog owner leaned out the door and shouted to Karsten, the six-year-old boy, Karsten, maybe you better not run. Listen, he doesn't like it when people run away from him. And so what you need to do, Karsten, is let him walk with you. Just put your arm over, stop, let him catch up to you, Put your arm over his neck and walk together with him and everything will be just fine. God doesn't like it when we run from him in sin. When we ignore what he's done for us in Jesus, when we pretend to be somebody we're not and yet live in the back room a different way. But if we'll stay close to him and walk with him through faith in Jesus is our only hope, then we'll be friends, Jesus says. And, and that powerful, holy growl of God won't be at us, but it will be for our protection to those who would do us harm. A fear that removes fear. If you'll fear God and trust Jesus as your Savior, you won't have to fear God. So here's where it gets real. What is it that you have been trying to hide from God? Or maybe you've been hiding it pretty well from everybody else, but what is it you've been trying to hide from God? Right now I'm talking to believers. Christian friend, maybe you've forgotten that your Father is holy, holy, holy. Hebrews 12, verse 22. What a, what a powerful passage this is. So encouraging and yet sobering. You have come to, the, to Mount Zion. This is for us as believers. And to the city of the living God. This is our hope. The heavenly Jerusalem. And to innumerable angels in festal gathering. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is our hope and inheritance in Christ. Therefore, verse 28. Therefore, 
Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. He's talking to believers. And he says, you have an amazing hope. You have an amazingly just a mind-blowing salvation in the present, but, but, but this is waiting on you in heaven, and he describes it. Therefore, be grateful that the kingdom you're inheriting is not like America. America will fall one day. It'll be gone one day. We're part of a kingdom that will never end. That's just getting started good. It cannot be shaken. So what do we do? Like, How do we respond to all that good news, all that grace, all that mercy from God? Let us offer to God acceptable worship. There's a right way to live for Jesus. With reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So here's the deal. You know what the Bible makes clear? If we profess to know Jesus but don't look like it, don't act like it, don't obey Him, Jesus said if you love Him, you do what? Obey His commandments. If we profess and say we love Jesus, but our lives betray us and they they prove that we don't, then we'll be some of those to whom Jesus says on the last day, you you say, Lord, Lord, but here's the deal. Get get, get away from me. I have never knew you. You used my name, but you, you never followed me. And what the author of Hebrews is saying here is, if you prove by your life that you never knew Jesus, you will know God is a consuming fire. It's a reminder to kind of go back and, 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 and revisit. We fear God in order that we may not fear Him. We fear God to be driven to the Savior so that all fear can be taken away. But if we live like we never met Jesus, if we live like we don't love Jesus, because Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments then all the New Testament scriptures make it clear you need to check up on what you're saying. Do you know him? Or are you just play acting, pretending? John Piper says there's terror when outside of Christ. But a different kind of trembling, reverence and awe, Hebrews 12, when in Christ. I don't fear the wrath of God as a believer. But I never forget who my Father is. He's holy, holy, holy. What do you need to uncover now, to confess to God now, receive His grace in this moment and forgiveness afresh? What is it you need to stop running from him in so that you can get back to walking with him as your all-knowing and loving father. Pastor Ray Ortland said, when the world sees more repentance in our churches, our churches will see more repentance in the world. This you know, I hear a lot of t- people talk about, man, I just, wish we, uh, I, just, I, I just wish God would send revival. Let me tell you where revival starts. Let me tell you how God starts revival when we repent of our hypocrisy. When we repent of the secret sins in our lives. And so suddenly, many people that say they want revival, let me just explain to you, they don't want revival. They want an emotional upper. They want some... Joe, some jazzed up service with this big emotional experience. They don't want spirit sent revival because that starts with with repentance for private sin. Y'all all right? That's rough, ain't it? This is one. I mean, I mean, Jesus. We're just all in Jesus hard sayings today. When the world sees more repentance in our churches, our churches will see more repentance. In the world, and again, mind your own little red wagon. We, we, we love to talk about what's all wrong with the world. How about starting with me? 
How about me dealing with me before a holy God? Let me get that right. You get that right? If we all collectively get that right as a church family, guess what? We'll have an impact on the world. Hello? Salt will be salty. Light will be bright in the darkness. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never yet confessed your sin to God for the first time and called on Jesus to rescue and forgive and cleanse you once for all today. Hear me, friend. Today is the day for you to fear the God who can cast your soul into hell because of your many sins against Him and then hear the amazing news that this same God so loved you that He sent His Son to die for all of your sins so that right now in this moment on March the 21st, 2021, you can trust in Jesus with the simplest dependence of a child so that when you leave this place today, you don't have to fear God, but can live from this moment on in the love of God that cast out fear. Will you run to Jesus today? A fear that removes fear. Will you, sir, will you, ma'am, Will you, young man, will you, young woman, turn from your sin and come to Jesus? Let's pray.